So welcome everybody again um, to our opening keynote by uh, Felix Delatre about open geodata for humanitarian action. Yes, welcome here. Yeah. Feel free. Yes, now I'm on the mic. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm very glad to be here. It's my um, last, uh, my, my, my first talk or like participation in a Debian um, event in seven years, I think. Wow, time is passing by so fast. In the meantime, I have been doing um, work with maps, with digital maps in, in different parts of the world and um, how to use them for, for, for good, for international cooperation and for humanitarian action. My background, I'm, um, I study digital media, um, I'm in open source since I'm, I don't know, 12, 11, something like that. And, um, and the last seven years I focused on maps um, and especially on places where there are no maps. Those are still surprisingly um, a lot of places in the world and um, that has a lot of implications to the people that live in those areas, right? If we are in Europe, we are used to have like a map and we sometimes even think about um, why do I need anything else, right? Because I can, I have my, my tools that I use, I have my maps that are printed that I can read. But that's not the case everywhere and if you're not living in a place where there is no map, you cannot figure out easily how to come from A to B. And um, it will be difficult maybe to reach a good doctor to know where's the next hospital. Um, and, um, but it has also implications on access to jobs, um, on leisure, right? If you know where to go, you probably would combine your ways more efficiently and you could, you could have more fun in life. And of course, when it, there's a disaster, then everything becomes like really essential and crucial and important. Um, and in the case of a disaster, imagine that you don't have a way of how to make even a plan of evacuation or where to find the next water supply. But what if one could change that? And of course, there's open source, there are all these tools, so we can go online, we can use this um, and add information to it. The, the parts that matter to each of us, um, that could be the neighborhood, but it can be also other things in, in your city or your country. One of the wonderful things that you can do with maps is you can travel, and, um, and at least in your imagination, and that's maybe also better for the carbon footprint. So I would like to take you to travel with me um, to some places in the world and to see what people have been doing with maps. And I want to start with you in Managua, Nicaragua, where I've been living for a long time. Um, this is not directly humanitarian, but it is definitely like development work that we can do with maps. And this way you also have like a little bit more um, uh, um, an impression from myself and what I've been doing. So Nicaragua is also one of those places where you don't have necessarily a map of everything. And, um, and we were like in those communities of open source and we were saying, hey, we want to do something. We want to use this technology to do something that, that, that helps us in our city. And um, Managua, the capital of two million inhabitants, is actually ha hasn't had a map of the public transportation system, which again seems maybe to be weird, but it is actually the the case in most cities in the world, I would say, that have a public transportation system don't have necessarily data from it. Um, there's also a study by World Bank that says 35% of the world's largest cities have no map and 92% of those from lower and middle income countries. So if you look at Africa, Latin America, big parts of Asia, there is no such information. And we said, hey, we want to use those tools, OpenStreetMap in that case, and we want to get this data and do something out of it. So um, we took paper, GPS devices, this was the time before a lot of people had smartphones with GPS um, um, <coughs> chipsets in there, and we started the collecting the data of the bus routes. Um, we did this in like community building purpose, so we um, trained over 200 people that were interested, everybody could join, um, a lot of people from universities, professionals, government employees, all kind of people that wanted to learn were welcome and, um, and we mapped this together. 
and we created the first actually um, public transportation map of whole Central America and um, we printed it, we gave it to the people and later on we also created like digital tools like an online platform or a mobile application for people. So this is what we can do, right? But what happens if not only one could change that, but we could do it all together as we are doing with open source, right? And this with an open street map means that there are mo one million people that have already contributed to, um, to this big database. And this, it is a global initiative similar to also to Debian that is based on collaboration um, to create a free and open world map. Um, the map has a, uh, the data has a free license, it's available for everybody for any purpose and um, everything that is added is going to be available. It is not the perfect comparison I would say but definitely one of the closest. OpenStreetMap can be titled like the Wikipedia of maps especially because um, there's a very low entry barrier. So you can like literally, as you can click on edit on, open, uh, on, on Wikipedia to add an article or to edit an article to, to improve the data that is there, the information that is there, you can click on edit on OpenStreetMap and the website would flip around and you get an editor. Um, on this editor, you can add points, streets, um, buildings, um, you can improve the data. And it is really very simple and everybody can do. Oftentimes, OpenStreetMap is seen as this website, right? That this open alternative to Google Maps. Um, I wanted actually to do this, this talk without mentioning this, this company name, but uh, okay. And, um, but there's a big difference, I think, that um, this is why I think there's no comparison, because one is a website where you can do what the company allows you to do, and the other one is actually you have, a da you have the data set and you can do everything with the data set. Um, the planet, you can download the whole planet of OpenStreetMap that's compressed around 80 gigs, um, uncompressed around a terabyte. Usually people wouldn't not download the whole planet, so you would definitely take a subset of it. But it, it shows that actually it is by now the largest um, agglomeration of geographic, open geographic data that we have. Um, and this is an extreme value and in a lot of places um, you can either start from zero or you start with what you have with OpenStreetMap which is already like a lot of good work. Um, this data can be used in all kinds of devices. It can be styled. The maps can look like you want them to look like. Um, you can use them in any kind of application. You can port them to different medias, paper. Um, print, um, you can have them in mobile phones. You can have special devices in, in, um, in trains or something. And I'm a big fan still of printed maps because they're just like accessible, you can use them. And also in our case where we wo work with governments and with um, humanitarian organizations, the paper map has a big value um, for planning because of its immediate access. We can do online maps. Um, by the way, this was one of the first online maps that I did, was the DEPCONF 12 map. Um, I'm still happy that it's online. So, um, <coughs> so we can style them, we can put things on top, we can really dig into the data, and we can of course use this data for um, geographic information systems, which is basically doing the professional work with geodata. Now I want you to take, not that far from Nicaragua to Haiti, um, you probably remember the, um, the big earthquake in 2010 um, that hit Haiti pretty strongly. And this is the poorest country in the Americas and literally at that moment when the when foreign help organizations came in, but also um, the, the local governments, when they wanted to address those issues, they had no geo information and they had no way of dealing with that and they had a problem with, um, with giving water to the people and to communicate where to get water. And this was before like everything started on like humanitarian work on OpenStreetMap, but some people said, hey, I want to help. 
and they used this open street map that at that point came um, at that point in time came like to a level that it had an editor that it was easy to do before it was like uh, much harder so they used it because they want to help and um, therefore I have a little um, visualization for you um, on the bottom left you see the days um, and this is the map of Haiti and you will see in colors the edits that are happening on it so you can see I think on the 12th it's the earthquake and people start mapping and within a few days there was already like some good information of the city and within less than two weeks there was a decent map of the whole country So the famous before and after picture. Um, this is the show's progress in only 28 days. Um, and um, this could then be immediately be used um, without any restrictions and, and uh, restrictions and, and was converted and could be used on devices and people were able to start like doing first maps of telling people where they get water. This was the very beginning. There were a lot of issues you perfectly know, right? You have a data set, somebody wants to use it within like three days. Yeah. Um, so, but this where this where we started, and this is where some organizations were founded within OpenStreetMap. One that I'm working for is the in one in the middle, and there are others. There's Cartoon G um, and Le Libre Geographe. They're all doing humanitarian work um, with OpenStreetMap. And we, we started um, becoming better. So we need, first we needed to coordinate, right? And, um, and we started creating tools that allowed us to work in bigger groups on, um, on data collection. Um, we also train organizations, schools, and companies um, to conduct so-called mapping parties or mapathons, um, where people physically meet to learn and map. This time I want you to take to West Africa, um, where in 2014 was this Ebola crisis. And this was where we already were kind of professionalized, right? So um, the international organizations asked us for data, but now the pipeline of actually having the data and consuming the data was already set up within Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, and others. So they had immediately the access to this data, and they could like say, okay, there's something happening in a certain area. They could ask people to map it, and then two days later, they had it on the ground. Um, to successfully combat Ebola, it's required to have the information on a house level because you want to know where some case happened, so you can send your disinfection teams to it, and you probably want to do some, um, yeah, some some measuring, some 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 means on 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 the surroundings of this place. Um, for this, we created one software, it's called the Tasking Manager. It's a very simple um, principle. It is basically you define a region that is of your interest, and then it would cut everything in like small pieces, like these little squares. And um, people can say, I'm working on this, I'm locking this, so that nobody other works on it and we don't have editing conflicts. Yeah. So usually people select one place, one, one task, and then they start off with a, with a satellite image. This is how it works. Um, by the way, when there's a disaster, it's sometimes easier to get satellite images than in, 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 in regular times, I would say. We have like basic coverage, but sometimes this is older. Um, if there are disasters, um, sometimes the, the, there are more people willing to donate satellite imagery. So based on the satellite imagery, people can start the drawing manually. And, um, and this is how um, it would look like um, to draw all the buildings in, in, um, in a part of, of Western Africa. If I talk about Western Africa, I mean Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And then this is the result of the remote mapping, um, which is then vector data that um, can be used in all kinds of programs, as I explained before. Um, Kwakadu in Guinea was one of like the critical epidemic centers where it wasn't clear, and then they spotted it as one of like the places where it's very um, urgent. And within five days, um, 
250, around 250 mappers created this. Um, now, like with the experience and with all the tools that are there, and those, um, this data was then um, used by the humanitarian organizations. In total, over the whole year of this Ebola crisis, there were 2,000 2, volunteers that participated in that, and we probably created as a result of this, not just addressing for humanitarian action, but also as a result, there was like the best map created of Western Africa. Total. Which, by the way, nowadays is used, of course, for other purposes, and that's great. Um, here, just like uh, um, a small logo introduction of like what are the organizations we are working with. There are more. Um, this is just like the ones that are more related to the to the examples that I'm giving here. And with those organizations, we were like seeing, hey, but there are still so many places in the world where we don't have geographic information, so how do we do that? Um, this is not energy consumption of the world, but it looks a little bit like that, actually. Yeah? But this means where we have data and open street map. And if you look at like India, China, where more than 3 billion people live, there, there should be more, infrastructure, uh, more data on it. Um, same for parts of Latin America and Africa, of course. Um, so um, we created this initiative called Missing Maps, where we want to put the most vulnerable places um, on the map. Why we say the most vulnerable places? Because you, um, surprisingly, there's a correlation um, that oftentimes the, um, the, the places that don't have geographic information are also the ones that are hit worst by um, disasters. Um, Missing Maps is definitely an armchair project, so people um, sit, meet in mapathons in Austria, like, like you can see here, or, uh, or sitting in the, in, the, in the comfort of their home to, to contribute. Um, but of course we are doing mapathons everywhere in the world, um, this is in, in Nicaragua again. Um, and we also go to places where people have, um, yeah, we, and we learn together and we also go to places where people are learning with us too. Um, so we even did a mapathon in the White House, um, not with this president, of course. Um, and um, I think it's particularly interesting um, because, because all, everybody who gets into OpenStreetMap has to learn. And like seeing this, that like these organizations and governments are like, catching up with learning what means open um, is, is, is great to see. We'll come back to that later. Um, this is in German, but it's a placeholder for this video that I wanted to show you, which is from Doctors Without Borders and gives you like a good impression of how the humanitarian organizations now perceive um, the, 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 the opportunities OpenStreetMap can give them. Okay, then we realized, of course, we knew before, but um, it is really important to, to, to highlight that remote mapping is, of course, possible, but it is not um, the most suitable form of mapping. Um, it, um, from satellite imagery, you can see houses, you can see roads, but you don't know whether this imagery is from today or from yesterday, um, and if the house is still there. And, of course, you don't know the names, you don't know the... Um, the, the, the function, the purpose of a building, whether there's a pharmacy or there's a casino in there. Um, so from a, from a data perspective, you need, you, need, um, you need definitely like local knowledge. But, I th but for me, 
the knowledge is much more important in a way of I want to differentiate it between information and knowledge while information is the artifact and knowledge is something that can only live in the head of a person because it's like when the, when the information is um, processed by yourself and um, and this is really important for OpenStreetMap because every place in the world is different and also how we started we didn't start like with one smart guy or girl that was saying, hey, we have this data structure and now let's stick to it. We are like actually moving as we are going. And um, this is, um, the, the, the local people are by default, when we talk about maps, they are the experts. Um, and this is why it's so important to let them become part of the whole movement. Um, to explain this a little bit more, um, I want to give you a little bit an introduction of how the data structure works in OpenStreetMap. So there are only three types of data. These are points, lines, and relations. And with this, we can actually build up polygons. Lines that are related are a polygon. Um, we can do, of course, all streets, and we can put points on it. Those are classified with a simple tag value pair or with tag um, va with key value pairs. Um, so, for example, here we have name and the name and highway a classification re classification residential. This is a very volatile data structure because there are no strict rules. You can basically put everything in there, and people put everything in there, um, literally. Um, we have a wiki, so you can you, we organize ourselves of how we use and how we formalize our data. Um, we do this through the wiki, we do this together. We fight a lot, of course. Um, we don't have a last instance that takes a decision. So we are, they are much flatter than, for example, wi even Wikipedia, um, because really everybody can edit and it is that simple. And there's no privileged role of being there for a longer time or something like that. We do have a police, we have a, we have a data working group, those are like three, four, five people. They have almost nothing to do. Um, and we have a lot of, lot of people with very um, curious eyes looking what people are doing. So this is how we, de um, how we defend ourselves. Um, and of course we have bots that look also for like malignous edits. So coming a little bit back on this local knowledge, I think here it's, it starts becoming clearer why it is not just about the data, it is about the people that are taking part in this, because we are constantly defining the data structure and it's changing and it's different in different countries maybe. And it's different even in the same country if two people have like a, um, a, a different idea on how to do it in their specific region for a specific topic. Um, and we have to constantly deal out how we how we how we move forward. Um, and um, and in this context, it is it is just like very interesting to see what are the like the particularities of OpenStreetMap in comparison to other open source projects. And I think here there's really um, to see the low barrier that I mentioned before of full of the full open um, contribution cycle. So you can you can enter. Everybody can enter. You don't have to be a full programmer. You you people that are just curious can enter. Click edit. They have there's a map. They put one point more on it, and they saw hey there was something I contributed and I have something bigger that I got out of it. This you can explain in one minute to almost everybody with some visuals and by the way this was also the reason um, why Nicaragua that became popular because we really had the chance to reach out to much more people outside of the bubble of our technical people because um, because it, it, it is clear it is very very obvious to people um, when it comes to visuals and when it comes to maps um, on the other side, I think um, this is this is I recently got inspired by the um, by the Open Knowledge Foundation um, that were like using those free components as like successful components of an of an of openness. 
um, of course, the open data, um, the data literacy that I think is oftentimes not enough pushed ahead, and this is what I was also um, uh, meaning when I say knowledge. Um, and the tool, the free software that, that, that allows you to actually deal with the artifact. And I think one particular uh, particularity of OpenStreetMap is that those three are somehow equal balanced. Um, and this also, of course, plays into the, the possibility that more people are, um, are like getting into it and understand the cycle because all three of them are there and they fit into each other. You could not take one piece out. Not at all. Um, and um, and this is true. Um, I mentioned it before on the on the World Bank uh, on the on the um, White House Mapathon that we have we have really got into a level of collaboration that is huge. So we have a lot of craft mappers, people that want to do it. Um, almost all Silicon Valley now uses OpenStreetMap besides the big G because they already have the monopoly on their stuff. Um, development agencies, UN organizations, humanitarian organizations, they all went into that and they all had to learn through that how to use open source and open data. And, um, and this is nice to see that this is like uh, happening for all, not just like for the, the people that, that we see like that they get in the first touch with technology, but people that are, that are like very huge but will Compl um, comply with these rules. Um, let's do quickly this last example, which is which is in Tanzania, where um, people are having a lot of problems with floodings, and um, and this has an effect on 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 the on the on the um, health of the people. Um, so we were using another tool, which is Open Aerial Map, together with Open Drone Map, that allows you to actually take yourself airborne imagery, upload it here under an open license, and it can be immediately used. And again, we created a wonderful map of the capital of Tanzania, um, together with students, um, a very local um, approach to that. Um, and this is very, uh, this I would say this is a very nice success story because then they founded their own organization and they are now um, spreading the, world, the word and the knowledge around OpenStreetMap in neighbor countries. The data itself is used um, by the city administration for planning now. Um, so a lot of like work has been doing and in, in, in getting closer to to the authorities here and to improve the situation, which is of course easier to do if you have a map to show what's going on. Quickly. Um, you don't have to <coughs> download the planet, you can do queries, there's an API for that. I think I don't have to go too deep into that. Um, if you don't like APIs, which I don't expect in this room, um, there's also an export tool where you can do this with click clicking, um, important for some organizations. And um, to finish, just um, some last examples, um, how this data can be used here. Doctors Without Borders took the buildings from OpenStreetMap. Based on this data, they estimated the population in different areas, and they knew how big their bag for vaccines needs to be if they go to certain places. Um, in the Philippines, which is highly exposed to, to, to tsunamis, um, we developed um, InnerSafe, which is a quantum GIS plugin um, where you can run risk scenarios. So you can use the data from OpenStreetMap. You can say, um, in this case, you combine it with a digital elevation model, and you say, OK, if the water comes up 10 meters, what happens? And you can do this for planning, and you can do this in the moment. And of course, in those, in those times, we cannot do a talk without mentioning deep learning. Huh? And, um, and we, do, we, do, we do some experiments with it. I mean, really, there we have to be very honest of what can be done. Some things that can be done is you can try to estimate 
what is on the, on, the, on the images, and then you can compare it with OpenStreetMap data, and then you maybe have an idea of where there's more work that needs to be done and where not. This is so far how we have been going. OSM is a big ecosystem. A lot of things that, don't, that are not called OSM are part of it. Um, so um, also a lot of work is happening in Debian. We could not survive without Debian, so thanks a lot also for all this good work. And if you are interested, um, you can always go to tasks.hotosm.org and start mapping. Um, there's always good um, work needed. Um, there are links on, on how to map. I'm happy to share the slides also afterwards. And um, there's a mailing list if you are more into that. Thank you very much. Um, I have two, two questions. So if I uh, got the process correctly, um, the first step in if you're mapping a new area is to take satellite images and then later the locals augment that data by adding street numbers or uh, street names or something. So the first question is, uh, how do we know that the coordinates on the satellite images are actually correct so the image is not displaced by some meters because it's a slanted area? And the other question is, once you've map the area, how do you keep that data up to date, like uh, new houses popping up, so are you looking at uh, satellite images again, or how do, does that work? Okay, um, two very good questions, because to both I don't have like a good answer. Um, <laughs> the, 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 f the first one is um, the, 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 the alignment or misplacement of satellite imagery. We have to deal with this all the time. So we see, we have usually several sources, and we see that they are not well aligned, we have possibilities of aligning them also in a community effort. So you could like on certain areas say this is an offset like this, this is an offset like that. Um, the whole map later? The whole tile. Like they, 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 they are working in tiles, yes it would, it would, um, um, it would correct that. Um, of course, this is why it, we need people on the ground. We need GPX data on, or like GPS um, exported data on the, that we can combine so we can see this, this line is the street and then if it's the, the satellite image is there, we start like moving it there. But I have to say, it never fits 100%. It's always an approximation. And sometimes it is also like it is off for some meters. Um, and the second question, keeping the data up to date. Keeping the data up to date, we are still there that we try to get all the data, but we already anticipate that keeping it up to date is actually more work than, um, than building it, because if you have an empty paper, it's easy to, to write something on it or to fill it, but if it's already full, it's dif more difficult to find which is not good anymore. Um, I, I would say the only solution for this is actually local communities that have an interest. Because if you're living in a place, you're verifying constantly and you, are, you have an interest in keeping this data up to date. So, yeah, so I, I started doing OSM a long time ago and recently did some hot mapping, which was great fun. It's terribly, terribly addictive. It's really dangerous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then we did it at work. So you go, excellent, I can call this work. Brilliant. So I did like two weeks of nothing else. Um, but the, <laughs> the problem, I, the biggest problem I found was uh, the, yeah, the, the dating of different aerial views. So, you know, in the middle of West Africa, you've got different satellite vintages. And I found it very hard to work out which was newer when they're not the same. And does that metadata exist? Is there an easy way to find out, or is it just hard? Not really, it is just hard. We would like to have better, um, like th there's one problem on having suitable metadata on satellite imagery, which is sometimes still hard because the providers are not doing that in a way that we would like this to have. Um, of course, we would like to have much more open imagery, but it's very expensive. Um, so yeah, it is, um, it is reading, asking, um, looking, um, sometimes even the providers have like you scroll a little bit to the side and it's another year then it is uh, there um, it is it is tough yeah we, we definitely <laughs> don't have a perfect situation on, on, on sources for satellite imagery
So if nobody has any questions anymore, let's thank Felix again. Thank you.